the voice of Sherry. Hi, this is Arlene, and you're listening to Durian ASEAN. Today, we are going to report to you uh, a, a host of news from Southeast Asia uh, in our ASEAN Breakfast Call. Starting the first one, we are going to talk about uh, the news regarding on the killing spree by this person, Elliot Roger. He was, he's just 22 years old, a very young chap, um, but also very disturbed. Uh, last few days ago, he killed six person and wounded thirteen in a massacre in Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara, California, and became a killer in part due to asparagus disorder. Said anyone with a mental condition, given the right environment, is capable of violence. But nevertheless, uh, as commented by. A consultant psychiatrist, Dr. Subhash Kumar Pillai from University of Malaya, he said that there's probably no link, direct link between asparagus disorder and brutal killing spree. Um, in fact, the psychologist says that there are so many episodes of shooting spree reported in the United States. I feel a lot of it is related to the environment that the child is brought up, he added. In fact, the Department of Psychological Medicine Associate Professor added that at this stage, it was merely conjured that Roger had this condition, which, it, which was also cited as being possibly linked to the killing spree committed by 20-year-old Adam Lenza in December 14, 2012. And case of Adam Lenza, he killed 27 people, including his mother and children. I totally uh, understand why Dr. Subhash Kumar Pillai said there's no direct link between asparagus disorder and his killing spree. I think there's a host of different reasons. And one of it is probably because the environment itself do not create, uh, is not conducive enough for him. Um, he complained a lot, especially in the document, 140 pages document. He stated that he's very lonely, he received very little love, and he, was, he wasn't really a happy person. And considering that he was so desperate to get a girlfriend and being a virgin killer, he wasn't able to get one, he put his revenge on women. In fact, some of his happier days... Uh, in Malaysia, interestingly, yes, he has a Malaysian mother and some of the excerpts in the 140 pages documents stated that he was happy holidaying in Malaysia and he felt at ease in Malaysia. So that was his Malaysian connection. Regarding on the asparagus uh, disorder, I, I personally believe it contributes a bit to his uh, mental health. Uh, unmental health, but at the same time, I don't think it's the reason for his brutal killing spree. In fact, uh, the brut uh, the killing spree is uh is not something new in the U.S. It happened quite a number of times uh, since the last ten years, and this shows that the environment in the U.S. is actually, hum somehow encourages this kind of behavior and the fact that guns are easily available in the US is not like in countries for example like Malaysia where it is outlaw and you need a special permit to own one but in the US it seems like anyone can own one without any repercussion so in that sense having the gun law in place uh, allowing guns to be able to get be freely access to even children and teens means that such behavior can only exaggerate it. And in that sense, this kind of situation would happen, which uh, caused the lives of six persons and wounded 13 during the massacre last week. Next off, um, talking about Malaysia earlier on, well, Najib begins his six-day visits to China. Prime Minister Datuk Seri Najib Tun Raza has visit, arrived in Xi'an, Shaanxi Province to begin his six-day official visit to China. 
he touched down at Xi'an Xiangyang International Airport yesterday at about 5.15pm together with his wife, Dustin Sri Rosma Manso. Najib is scheduled to officiate at the Malaysia Xi'an Halal Food Festival week and visit the Great Mosque and Museum of Qing Terracotta Warriors and horses on Wednesday before departing for Beijing. His visits to China is conjunction of the 40th anniversary of bilateral relations between Malaysia and China on May 31. He vis- his visit is particularly poignant as it was his father, Tun Abdul Raza Hussein, Malaysia's second prime minister who established diplomatic ties with China in 1974. And this, is, this was significant and yesterday we discussed for an hour regarding on panda diplomacy and uh, Najib being at the receiving end of the two pandas meaning that we are quite serious in terms of our bilateral relations between Malaysia and China in fact the economic relations between Malaysia and China is a very important one Malaysia is China's major trading partner and uh, at the same time, uh, why Xi'an? Xi'an has one of the highest Muslim, Hui Muslim populations besides Xinjiang. And Xi'an also have a lot of historical monuments and mosques um, and other Islamic uh, cultures and culture and arts. So in that sense... Mm. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Najib, I think he he wants to expand the halal food industry, and the halal food festival week in Xi'an is just perfect. Mm. In recent in recent times, issues regarding on halalness of a certain items, food items has been questionable, and especially with the case of the Cadbury chocolate. Um, seems like it's quite vague in terms of what constitutes halal because uh, it was spotted that the Cadbury chocolate contains some DNA of uh, pigs. So in that sense, I guess halalness is very important among Muslims and this is something that uh, it, it shouldn't be seen as just an industry but it's also something that uh, should be a minimum requirement for uh, food items. I think halalness goes beyond just having pork DNA. It also it also means that the food must be clean and also be slaughtered of a certain way. But at the same time, um, the halalness of certain food is also um, the the way the author- Malaysian authority handle it is also questionable because the blame is being put to the producer themselves when it was the religious officer who failed to inspect and check on the, uh, the items itself. And I'm re- relating to the Cadbury chocolate incident. So it, this is, I think this has caused a major uh, branding suicide to Cadbury chocolate itself. Next off, also we are talking about Malaysia. Uh, it seems like the Malaysia's empl- unemployment rate is down to 3% in March. So Prime Minister Datuk Sri Najib Tun Razak, in expressing his appreciation to all those who have ensured that the marketplace for jobs in Malaysia was always stable, um, he's quite actually happy that the decrease to 3% of the unemployment rate. And he he expressed this in his tweet, Twitter. <laughs> Seems like politicians have been re- releasing their a lot of their statements in Twitter and other social media, which I think is kind of interesting. Seems like, I guess, politicians have really keeping up with technology. Anyway, back to the story. Najib says that in this reference to the Malaysian Labour Force Statistics monthly release to March of Released for March 2014, which cited that the unemployment rate in Malaysia was 3% in March 2014, down to 0.2% from the 3.2% in the previous months. According to the reports that was released on Tuesday, as of March 2014, the Malaysia labor force was 13,804,043,000. People with 13,427,800 employed and 4,000,000 uh, 
115,700 unemployed. So, I mean, it's a good thing, I think, uh, for having the unemployment rate down. I guess it, uh, it also shows that um, people might be happier in their workforce, workplace right now, but happy, I guess, in terms of getting into the workplace. But being in the workplace, I I have doubts on that. Like, just a couple of weeks ago, I read there's a statistic that shows that Malaysia is among the most unhappiest in the workplace. They don't feel that they are being well cared. Uh, they don't feel a sense of connection with uh, the, their workplace. And they feel that their workplace has sort of reduced them into just mere drones. A lot of the Malaysians have to work long, long hours. They don't really have workers' rights to be exact with. I mean, we don't even have like real unions unlike before this. Um, so in this in this sense, the employers is at the hu- upper hands. But don't fret not. I think um, it's only a matter of time where um, things will be in place. Although at the same time, we also have to do our part. Regarding on the unemployment rate down to 3% in March, it could be just a season thing like um like things just go up and down depending on the situation at hand but it doesn't mean that on the long term it is something plausible i think it is important that um, is uh, the government not just see the problems as in related to unemployment but also whether workers are satisfied with their work with their career because a lot of people feel that feel the pinch of the cost of living, but at the same time, wages are stagnant and the workplace is not conducive enough for them. It's not inspiring. It's just, they, they just go to work and for more than, uh, some for more than eight hours and go back and that's their lives. So I think a lot of people are seeking something more in life, even though the unemployment, unemployment rate is down to 3%. But I personally believe that... Uh, b- People are still not happy with their work, as in like they still want something more out of it rather than just going to work, just as it. And I mean, people want to live a better lifestyle. Having a better standard of living is, I think, a crucial point um, for the government to make it as a rate, uh, as a sort of percentage, to understand the Malaysian societies. Besides having just the unemployment rate statistics, so um, moving on from China and from Malaysia, we definitely have to talk about the situation between Vietnam and China. So Vietnam fishing boats rammed and sunk by China's ship. Um, the unfortunate event was happened yesterday, and a Vietnamese fishing boat was rammed and sunk by a Chinese vessel amid a tense territorial confrontation in the South China Sea over Beijing's deployment of an oil rig. It was stated by the, a Vietnamese official on Tuesday. So, and the, first, the person confirmed that the fishing vessel was rammed and there were 10 fishermen on board um, which are on land right now. They are safe, but their ship sank. A Vietnamese maritime safety official told AP about this. So the Monday's incident was the first reported sinking of a ship since the dispute flared in early May. Dozens of Chinese and Vietnamese vessels, including many civilian and fishing boats, have engaged in repeated skirmishes near the giant oil rig, including reports, rammings, and the use of water cannons. The crew of the sunken Vietnamese boat told authorities the attack occurred near the oil rig, which is positioned in the vicinity of the Parasol Islands, said the official. Uh, this is uh, something, un- I don't think this is something um, that China should continue practicing. I mean, South China Sea, it, it, is, it is a very disputed uh, territory a territory in the Southeast Asia, but it seems like the oil minerals, the rich oil minerals there is one of the reasons why China wants to lay its hands on the South China Sea. And as we reported 
in our daily news, it seems like China has been quite offensive. There are a number of uh, fishing boats and um, other um, other um, sort of local vessels that belongs to either the Vietnamese or the Filipinos that were being shooed away by the Chinese ship or being rammed f- uh, at, for this one. So it, it is not something good. I, I don't think that it is something that would uh, create a positive relationship between ASEAN and China. Maybe between Malaysia and China because we are, we are in fact quite far from the sub-China Sea compared to other countries and we our our interest between Malaysia and China is not so much on the area of maritime but more on the area of economy unlike those two countries where the South China Sea is also part of their oceans in 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 this sense i think it's either China and Philippines align themselves with another superpower which is the US or ASEAN itself strengthen its capabilities in terms of being able to confront China on this a host of these security and maritime issues. Or China has to back down and realize that they, they, they should reduce their sense of empire seeking by laying its stake on t- the sea, since it can't lay in stake on the land, it should realize that it is important to work together, to collaborate, rather than to simply be offensive on the South China Sea areas. Next off, uh, we um, move on to the Philippines. Uh, I just mentioned about the Philippines uh, earlier on regarding on the South China Sea disputes, but this time it's about their do- domestic issue. So Philippine police shoot dead eight suspected robbers. So the police shot dead eight suspected robbers in a gun battle at a checkpoint near the Philippine capital on Tuesday. It, it is said that the officers in the town of Silang, 44 kilometers or 28 miles south of Manila, received a tip that nine men re- riding four motorcycles were on their way to rob a store. So police set up a checkpoint, but motorcycle riders drove through it, sparking a shout-out. Eight of the suspected were killed and eight handguns recovered afterwards, with a one suspect escaping at a the statement from the local force. So police is still on the lookout for these uh, uh, suspected uh, robbers who shoot death. Uh, sorry. Um, so police um, is still... Uh, I mean, so, so the situation itself is... It seems like... Uh, apologies for my misreading just now. So the eight suspects, uh, spe- suspected uh, robbers were killed and... And I guess the place there has become peace again. But I think it's important to look at a bigger picture here. So seems like life in the Philippines is not worth that much, especially if you are if you are a robber a robber. So police can simply like shoot you that shoot you down. That's it. Like I don't think killing a suspected criminal or a criminal is the way to go. I mean, they should be detained, of course, for their misconduct, but they shouldn't be just simply killed off. Seems like life is worthless if a person is just... um, The way to deal with it is just to kill a person rather than thinking that he could turn into a better person and contribute to society one day. In fact, I mean, on the the bigger picture as well, uh, uh, when... a a, a, uh, a criminal activity in a, a place has increased is also show another side of uh, the area which is it is not so much on the criminals itself but more on the, on why the criminals become criminals why the robbers become robbers and I think it has a lot to do with the socio-economic condition 
of the Philippines. When you have high inequality, you have high expectation, what kind of lifestyle that you should live, when people feel miserable with their lives and they need to uh, get out from that particular situation. So they rob. I mean, they justify robbing. by, And this is... An, an, unfortunately, this is the real issue that I think not just the government of the Philippines, but uh, the society in general need to tackle the issues here. Um, so moving on to uh, India. So Modi to be sworn in as India's new Prime Minister, Hindu nationalist ne- Narendra Modi, Will be sworn in India's new as in <laughs> sorry will be sworn in as India's new prime minister on Monday in a ceremony to be attended by arch rival Pakistan's premier for the first time in the two nations' history. The 63-year-old hardliner won a landslide election victory, handing him a powerful mandate to revive India's stagnant economy and implement more assertive foreign policy after 10 years of left-leaning Congress party rule. Modi, leader of the right-wing Bharatiya Janata Party, invited Pakistani counterpart Nawaz Sharif to Monday ceremony in a first bold step aimed at mending strained highs between nuclear armed neighbours. Modi, the son of a tea store owner, wow, secured the biggest majority in 30 years at the election, trouching the scandal plug Congress on the promise to revive manufacturing and investment to create millions of jobs. He pledged to overhaul the flagging economy won over voters. Along his wreck to riches story and reputation as a clean and efficient chief minister of prosperous Western Gujarat state, I think this is a. I mean, this is a good thing, considering that uh, India definitely need a push on its economy, and having someone that who used to be a chief minister and who used to uh, deal with a Western Gujarat state, uh, and 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 remain. And make it make it remain prosperous is definitely a good CV for him, and at the same time, I think for India, for to to be able to have good bilateral relationship with Pakistani, uh, Pakistan, I think this is a very good move. Even though he's a Hindu nationalist, but he see that the the future of India needs they need Pakistan. In a way, I mean, it is their neighbor. Having a rival, a constant rival, is a pain in the neck. So why don't you be friends and ensure that you know both of them are fulfilling each other's uh, nationals in national interests. But then it's also so a trend now. There's a rise in a lot of nationalistic uh, party or individuals in a lot of countries, and in the case of India. The Hindu nationalists want a majority and being given the mandate to rule India. It seems like I read, uh, I remember I read an article yesterday or two days ago, I can't remember, where there's a rise in nationalism among countries that do not really have a real ideology. And with capitalism system becoming more and more. Mm, significant in all these ASEAN Asian countries people need an ideology f- to back them to back them up and since uh, socialism and other f- forms of ideology and even Islamism has sort of waned its way away and so so a lot of people just see that nationalism is the way in the way for them to uh, gain uh, their own understanding, their own reputation, and also their own uh, self determination as the nation, and uh, is is I guess it's a trend right now, and the trend it seems to be society just want to have something, uh, an ideology to back them up, and nationalism is it. 
Next off, we go on to our last news, which is Myanmar. So Myanmar moves religious controversial controversial. Uh, sorry, Myanmar moves religious conversion curbs. Myanmar is considering restriction on religious conversion, according to a draft bill released in a state media Tuesday. The first of several controversial proposals stemming from a rise tide of Buddha nationalism. The proposed legislation put forward by the Ministry of Religion and yet to be debated in Parliament would require people who want to change their faith to get approval from a special, specially created local authority. No one shall apply to convert religion with the intention to insult, defame, destroy or misuse any religion. Uh, it was stated and reported in the Myanmar language newspaper, The Mirror. It added that under the proposed law, an, any violation could attract a two-year prison sentence and that's a lot, I think. Religion has become a deeply sensitive issue in a Buddhist majority Myanmar, where several outbreaks of anti-Muslim violence in the last two years have left around 250 people dead. The proposal on religious conversion as part of a wider series of draft bills being considered by government ministries and suggested by President Tien Sen after a campaign by extremist monks, a highly controversial plan to impose restrictions on interfaith marriage is also being considered, but details have yet to be revealed. I am not feeling well with this piece of news. I think uh, restriction on religion's conversion is definitely not a good idea. I mean, we have um, the simil a similar ex uh, experience in Malaysia where people... Uh, the, I mean, Muslim cannot intermarry with non-Muslim and uh, you cannot just simply convert to other religion unless you are a non-Muslim to, to another... to, to an Islamic faith. <laughs> And I think a lot of these attitudes stem from a very xenophobic uh, perspective. I think they see Muslims in their country as pests, as some as something that they need to get rid of or they need to separate themselves of. And interestingly, um, them being a Buddhist majority nation, meaning that they are using using utilizing religion as the state ideology. And I think the same thing or similar way can be described about our country, considering our country's history and Myanmar history is quite similar. Both of the countries were being colonized by the British. They have quite a multi-racial, diverse communities, but they do have a majority uh, population that is of a certain religion. And in the case of Myanmar, is Buddhism, while Malaysia is Islam. So naturally, um, the majority population and the government itself would use religion to control the society and to separate the society against those that they deem undesirables or people that they don't want to be associated with. And in the case of Malaysia, uh, the government has always instilled uh, an affirmative plans that would uh, sort of favor Muslims or Malays against other races and other religious believers. The same goes with uh, uh, Burma, it seems like, in Myanmar. Uh, a Buddhist majority country, they want to use policies and the government to separate Muslim from other religion. And this is one of the reasons why they have the religious controversial bill and also in the future, they might have an interfaith uh, marriage bill. And this is not uh, going to uh, the path that is supposed to be positive. I mean, they are on the, on the road towards democracy. And it seems like democracy is not there yet. Uh, because in a country, in a democratic country, everyone has equal rights. They have equal chances to expand themselves and they should be able to uh, 
live in freely in a country without feeling that they need to be restricted just because they are of a certain religion and of a certain faith. And they should be allowed to marry whoever they want to be uh, uh, married with instead of being forced to you know, be in their own cocoon of their own race, their own religion. So I, I think Myanmar should really reconsider what they are doing right now and ensure that they, they really... Uh, they really sort of transit smoothly towards a more democratic nation and everybody is rooting for that. Everybody is rooting for Myanmar to be a more democratic nation. So that's all for our news today. Uh, I'm glad that you're listening to, you are listening to us. We will continue again uh, later for, for our segment Blast from the Grassroots. So let's continue to listen again at the ASEAN Breakfast Call. Thank you.